Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy was issued. And in its 10th paragraph, it declared that the Sunday Mass, and Catholics knew this beforehand, before this, but it declared it succinctly and firmly, that the Sunday Mass is the source and the summit of our life together as the Catholic Church. The source to say that we get all our juice, we get all our direction, we get all our energy, we get all God's grace to live the gospel by coming here and by receiving four important gifts. The word of God, timeless and eternally true, that sort of shapes and forms our attitudes and behaviors. The body and the blood of Christ, strength to live the gospel and mercy for those times we fall short since his blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. An outpouring of the Holy Spirit because wherever two or more gather in his name as Jesus promises in the gospel, he's right here in our midst. And the fourth thing that we get from coming here, and I think it gets underestimated, undervalued a lot, we get the good example of each other. I mean, we are an intergenerational community. So infants, remember a couple of weeks ago, three-day-old Max was here at Sunday Mass with his mom and dad. And uh, we stretch all the way through all different circumstances and vocations and personalities into the 80s and 90s and everywhere in between. And just our coming here together declares some important things about us, even if we don't know each other's names that we believe in Jesus, that we take him to heart, that we trust in his mercy, that we need his strength, that we think he's cool and we want to become more and more like him, not just as kids and then outgrow it, but all the way through. So we get our juice to be Christians individually and together by coming to the Sunday Mass. And it's also the best glimpse, the summit or the high point it's the best place for us to see what we're going to look like in heaven. Please, God, if we can all make it there. One table, one Lord, everybody welcome, a banquet that goes on. We know the truth, our questions answered. We're happy to be here. So the church every Sunday looks like heaven. And that's the other piece of why it's so important, that every Sunday we remember the resurrection of Jesus. It's our parish feast day every Sunday. And while for many of us, we can go long stretches where death is nowhere near on the radar screen, it's only something that happens to other people. We don't even have to go to a funeral sometimes for years or decades. But there's enough of us in this room every Sunday that realize that sooner or later, someone we love will experience their dying day. And so will we. And how to explain that greatest of all mysteries, in a sense, that greatest of all fears, we see it in the light of Jesus, who wasn't afraid of death, who embraced it and came back from the tomb and lives forever. And we claim our share in that action. And so what the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy declared, the source and the summit, this is the main event. Nothing more important in our parish or our universal church that goes on. Nothing more necessary for us to receive the gifts of this experience and especially in terms of our good example, brothers and sisters, we need each other to be here. And when someone is absent, we are diminished. We are depleted. You might not think that, but it's true. When we're absent, it's felt. Not only by the one who's absent, but by the ones who are present. So with that background, I'd ask you to sort of run through uh, the Mass by the numbers. Three ways to think of the Mass, first of all. Could we think of it as a meal? I mean, after all, it was instituted, the Eucharist, in the context of the Jewish Passover supper. Jesus coming to the close of his earthly life, beginning to see the world about to come crashing down upon him, the tide of public opinion turning against him. He huddles up with his closest disciples. He knows his death is close. He wants to give them something, figure out some way, something to help them remember what it was all about. Cliff notes, so to speak. And so he washes their feet and tells them, tells us we must do the same. 
And he takes the bread and breaks it and realizes it's like his flesh that will be broken and torn apart. And he takes the cup and shares it around because he realizes it's like his, his blood that will be poured out on the cross. So it's a meal. And so we have a table, the family table that draws us together. We use the best of what we can, can muster to make it a meal, not fast food. Uh, and I'm not just pitching for long homilies here, but if we're in a hurry to get in and get out, you know, like Father Rollinger's 12-minute special, the mass over at the high school when I was a young teacher, what does that say to each other or to God about why we're here? If this is the most important event of our church, nobody leaves a banquet early, do we? You know, seconds, maybe twice on the desserts, maybe a little after dinner drink, maybe the conversation is so important that we, don't, that we just want to linger a little bit longer. The other piece of it is that the table reconciles us. We all know it, those of us who are adults especially, you can't be at a table and stay mad at somebody, right? Only got two options, either to make up and stay at the table or to leave the table. I remember once having a beef with one of the brothers at the priory when I was a young priest. He didn't care for the way I celebrated Mass, and he, he let me know it. I was really hurt and angry, and so I messed around with his thermostat in his room so he couldn't get his room above 55 degrees. I thought it was cool then. I realized it was silly now. But at any rate, we were mad at each other, and one night we got plopped next to each other at the table at the priory. <coughs> he was no more happy about it than I was. I had to make a decision, either wolf down my food and get out of there, or apologize. That night I didn't have the courage to apologize, and so in seven minutes I had my supper done, and I was leaving. Eventually we made peace before his dying time came. Uh, I hope he's hearing this now and knows it, but uh, uh, the table, to stay away from the table drives a wedge between us and those whom we may disagree with or have been hurt by or have hurt ourselves. To belly up to the same board connects us all in an intimate way. And so the Mass is a meal. It's also a sacrifice. It represents, it doesn't do over again. It reminds us that the one sacrifice of Christ on the cross at Calvary echoes through the ages. His offering of himself on the cross, it's like if you're up north on a snowy night in the winter at Morgan Lake, and if you scream across the lake, the echo keeps going out and out and out. So does Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross until every generation picks it up and hears it. He showed us how to live. He showed us how not to be afraid. He died for us and came back from the dead. And so the Mass represents that great mystery had a mischievous art student once years ago. His sketchbook would be full of images of the crucifixion. He had more demerits than I think anybody in his class, but his sketchbook was full of these crucified images. So I asked him one day, Mark, what's up with that? He looked at me without missing a beat. Father Tim, the crucifix is a sign of someone who believes in something so much they're willing to give their life for it and death. There's nothing cooler than that, is there, Father Tim? And don't most of us in this room do that? Husbands and wives, you gave yourselves away because you believe in the one you gave yourself to. Moms and dads, you give yourself to your kids, right? That's how we become holy, by giving ourselves away for what we really believe. The scouts and their values, same thing. You're rolling out early on a Sunday morning for this meal and for the meal you're serving the rest of us after Mass. It's a sacrifice, right? but you're willing to do it because you believe in it. And so the Mass helps us to understand what we believe in and to compel us to give ourselves away like Jesus did. And the Mass is also a sacrament. That is to say, an outward sign that Christ is present. I like to think of it when we receive the body and blood of Christ, all of a sudden we're tabernacles with legs and feet, not just bolted to a, a marble table as our tabernacle is in the chapel. We take Christ out. We become his real presence in the world by the way we live, by the way we take the gospel message and put it into practice. 
I mean, the directives tell us to genuflect before the tabernacle. Philippians 2, every knee will bend at the name of Jesus. But if we carry Jesus within ourselves after Mass, then shouldn't we be taking a knee before each other, at least having some reverence? The monks uh, in Benedictine communities do it. They come down the aisle two by two, they bow to the altar, and then they turn and bow to each other. If one's just had a fight with the other, that might be sort of difficult on some Sunday mornings. But to want to receive, to, to recognize Christ in each other, that's our mission. That's our mission once we leave here. So a, a meal, a sacrifice, and a sacrament. And then uh, uh, if we can just keep going by the numbers, four points of focus in a church room. Some of them you'll get right away. I bet there's one that you won't get at all, which uh, uh, I hope it surprises you and delights you. But the focal point of a church room is the altar. The altar isn't just the place where we do the Eucharist or where the body and blood of Christ rests. The documents teach that the altar is Christ. It's not a lamp table, it's not an M table or a junk collecting table. Only the bread and the wine and the book. If you need, well, we need the book. So uh, those are the things that get placed on the altar. In many churches, it's immovable, like Christ, the rock of our salvation, that line from the scriptures. Because it's the center point. When everything else is shifting around us, Christ stays constant in love and truth and mercy and tenderness and challenge and all the rest that comes from the gospel. So the altar, one important place in a church room. The ambo or the pulpit, the other. A kind of altar, another kind of table from which the word is proclaimed. Not read like I'm reading the obituaries, but proclaimed, announced by our brothers and sisters who serve as lectors, by Deacon Don or myself who proclaim the gospel at Mass. We believe that at that time, it's really God speaking to us, using other people's voices and voice boxes and lips but other, it's God speaking to us. And then, I know this is maybe a little bit tender, but the pres presider's chair is also a focal point in the church. The priest is supposed to, I must admit, sometimes I fall short on that. You know that better than I do, I suspect. Uh, the priest is supposed to act in the person of Christ. You have a right to expect your priests and deacons and bishops to be like Jesus to be good shepherds, to be humble servants, to speak the truth and be tender-hearted. But not only the, the presider's chair isn't a focal point just because of me or Deacon Don or whoever happens to sit in it. It's a reminder that all of us by our baptism are priests and we're meant to be Christ-like in the world. That phrase, I've used it in homilies before, I love the Jesus I see in you. Somebody tells you that, you know you're doing a good job at being a Christian. I love the Jesus I see in you. So the chair is a symbol not of authority. You notice it's not a throne. It's not a cathedral, a bishop's chair. It's just a chair that stands for the business of humble service. That's all of our, all of our call. And then fourthly, this is the one that at least other times people haven't, uh, haven't gotten. The other important focal point in the church is you, the assembly. Vatican II declares that the assembly is the primary sign of the real presence of Jesus Christ. Present here, 333 Hilltop Drive, Green Bay, Wisconsin, here and now, Sunday Mass, 830. That you and me together, it's Jesus' words, they're not just making this up. Wherever two or more gather in my name, there I am in the midst of them. At the altar, at the pulpit, in the service of the one who presides, but in the assembly, in us, together, with our wounds and our hopes and dreams and our virtues and our sins and our needs and our charity, Christ is present, dying and rising in us. Like Linus says in the Peanuts comic strip, kind of makes you want to treat us with a little bit more respect, right? We are the presence of Christ. 
So four places, altar, pulpit, presider's chair, and mostly in the assembly. Those are the four major focal points in any Catholic church. And then we also got uh, four books. Uh, the most important one first. Gospels. So the words and the story of Jesus, it's larger than all of the other books. It's dolled up with a fancy cover. It's carried in when the deacon is present, sometimes accompanied by candles. It's incensed. The one who proclaims the gospel kisses the book after. Might seem sort of weird, but it's the word of God that we love so much. So the gospel passage is, there's no book more important in Catholic tradition, in Catholic life, than the book of gospels. It's Jesus speaking to us so that the word can be made flesh. The lectionary is the second book. It contains the Old and New Testament passages in a three-year cycle so uh, that we hear a good sampling of the Bible if we're at Mass most weekends for three years. Uh, they say, you know, the, the illusion that Catholics don't know the Scripture, whoever figured out the template or the scheme for this three-year cycle is just amazing. A smattering of Old and New Testament stories and truths uh, that are proclaimed from the pulpit by our brothers and sisters who are lect lect lectors. That's why I call the lectionary. Uh, it's a sample of readings. I'm going to put it on the pulpit so that our two lectors have it when they need it in a moment. Two other books then. The Roman Missal, sometimes it's called the, the Sacramentary. Uh, it's like Coach Lafleur's playbook over at La 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 Lambo. It basically tells the presider what to do. The prayers are, have been written. Some go back to the ninth century. Some were written. One of my seminary professors wrote some of the revisions back in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, it's got the different Eucharistic prayers, so it leads the priest around. So I'm not just making this up. It comes from our tradition. And uh, one of the pieces in it, uh, the term rubric, sometimes that's said with sort of a nasty, snarky kind of a, an attitude, it comes from the word, the Latin word ruby, which means red. Basically, the instructions for what the priest should do are in red, and the words he's supposed to say in black. So do the red and pray the black. So he extends his arms. He makes the sign of the cross over the assembly or the gifts. He bows. Those are the instructions. So the Roman Missal keeps me on track, keeps the priest on track, uh, and uh, is a gift to our church. And the other important, and we've got two of them in, in the pews, the fourth book of our Catholic tradition at Mass is the hymnal. It's the song book. St. Augustine, 430, he died in northern Africa. We follow his rule at the Abbey. Uh, he said, the one who sings prays twice. The one who sings prays twice. It's like double bubble on Friday night at your favorite pub. Or it's like twofers uh, if you're buying a bakery or something like that. To sing... Is, is an important part of the liturgy, and not performance, not so much solo. We're called to sing together. The choir, the music ministry leads us. How beautiful is that? The gift that God has given in terms of voice and instrument and direction, but we're all called to be a part of it. I'll say that sometimes is a struggle. Sometimes here, really every place I've ever had mass, I get to the front and turn around and a good share of the assembly is not singing, whether it's an old Catholic rouser or a more new or contemporary song. I just suggest that uh, it's really an important part of your work. It's not the Widener or the Performing Arts Center in Appleton. This is a spec it's, it's not a spectator sport. Singing is part of how we get involved. And even if you don't think you have a great voice, I sat next to one of the Norbertines in choir yesterday morning. He can only sing one note, but he sang it for every syllable. And at first it was irritating, and then as, we, as he kept persisting, I realized, Father really wants to pray this morning. And that's the important thing. He really wants to pray. 
I tell groomsmen at wedding rehearsals, a lot of times I just ask them to sing an hallelujah. If you don't think that God gave you a good voice, then here's your chance to get even. Sing loudly and make God listen in God's house to the voice God gave you. You know what I mean? But please, to not be afraid to sing. Uh, maybe it takes a few verses to warm up or a few weekends to learn our new hymn, but everybody's got a voice, and it's one of the ways that we give praise and thanks to God. Obviously, too, then, since it's a meal, there's, there's dishes. Uh, the cup for the blood of Christ is called a chalice. We've gone back to using that term. The big thing about it is that it's, it's used only for that purpose. So I won't mix my dad a Wayne Teeny in this this afternoon. It's only used for the celebration of the Mass. Uh, the, the instructions say that the materials must be noble and simple. And then it's up to the diocesan bishop to decide the details of that. So this, this cup was made by a parishioner over at Lourdes for me. He took it over to Bishop Ricken to bless. And uh, Bishop Ricken said, well, you can't use that because it's wood. And it'll absorb uh, the, the liquid of the blood of Christ. So uh, we looked over at the abbey in the basement. A lot of priest chalices abandoned down there in the, in the basement. A sign from God. What's that? We'll keep going. <laughs> But uh, at, at any rate, so uh, uh, it took the cup and epoxied it in, and the bishop was fine with our using it. Uh, so uh, in some dioceses, crystal can be used. In some dioceses, ceramic or pottery can be used. That's the bishop's discretion. Bishop's Ricken, bishop Ricken's preference is that we use some sort of precious metal, and so we do. Then we'll use a plate. I use a wooden one. To be honest, the wood stuff for me, if Christ was born in a barn laid in a manger box, it seems to me that the wooden connection with the vessels speaks that. Maybe you caught that at Christmas. Maybe not. That's my intention anyway. And then uh, a covered dish is just to keep the reserved sacrament. It's called a ciborium. Seba is uh, bread. I'm forgetting which language, but seba is, is bread. So it's, it's in a sense like a cookie jar. Okay, we, and in some ways, cookies are the blessed sacrament, I suppose, in, uh, uh, in some homes. Napkins, usually they're, again, they're only used for this purpose. A big one called a corporal to catch the crumbs of the bread that we use. When you work with bread, there's always going to be crumbs. And uh, uh, a napkin, purify, a purificator, since we believe that the bread and the wine become the real presence of Jesus, even the leftovers, <coughs> even the crumbs, we treat, treat with reverence. Not obsessive compulsive disorder, but with reverence because we trust that this is Christ. Okay, home stretching here. We're doing okay. I think we're doing okay. The vestments I'm just going to uh, talk about briefly. This is the way people dressed in Jesus' time. They had undies, of course, but otherwise it was just a big white t-shirt. It could be in colors, too. It was a, called a tunic. Uh, it's called an alb as a vestment, and it's white. And we got it, each one of us, at our baptism. And if you want to wear an alb in church or at home or going to get groceries at Festival Foods or any other grocery store, you've got a right to do it. It's the, it's the garment of a Christian. They come in different styles. Long sleeves help me. I'm a little nervous, so they weigh my, my arms down so they, you can't see me shake so much. Uh, some people, it's like with hoodies. Some like a zipper, some like a crew neck sweatshirt. I like one with a hood, to be honest, because uh, I take it to mean that it's not only what we do as Christians, but that we balance it out with prayer and that we anchor what we do in Christ. And so the hood reminds me of the monks who spend their time quietly, peacefully, listening first for what the Lord wants them to do and then doing it after they've started their day with prayer. So... Um, I had uh, a friend over at Lourdes, she was a music minister, Jean Pischke. Uh She led our word and communion services, so she got one of these for herself and uh, then was diagnosed with cancer. She said to me a couple months before she died, she said, Tim, I'd like to be buried in my alb. Would that be okay? Well, Jean, that's your right, of course. But you gave me the alb. Is it okay that I get buried in it? Because it's not coming back. <laughs> that's fine, Jean. And there she was, laid out in an alb, a symbol of her Christianity and a symbol of her ministry. 
had a, cup, a pair, a bride and groom a few years back, almost 20 years now. They looked at the cost of wedding dresses and rental of tuxedos, and they thought, nuts to this. And so they bought each of themselves a nice alb, and that's what they wore at their wedding mass, both of them. And then they left them there in the parish so that if another couple wanted to do that, the duds were already hanging in the closet, just had to be dry cleaned or taken through the laundry. It's a symbol of innocence, too. When I put it on, if I've been good, if I've uh, lived a good Christian life, if I've been a good parish priest, a good Norbertine, okay, it affirms that. But if I've fallen short, in some sense, to put this on as an examination of conscience, I don't deserve to wear it on a given day. I've been sharp with a brother or I left work undone here in the parish that needed to be done. So the alb, it's the basic Christian garment. The stole is a symbol that I'm not just showing up here saying, I think I'll do mass today. How about that, you guys? The stole is a sign that the church has educated and prepared and examined and formed me and commissioned me to serve as a priest. So it's a symbol that I have the church's permission, I hope yours too, but the church's permission to lead in the celebration of the sacraments. So the priests kiss it, deacons too, because we're grateful to be called. We know we're not worthy to be called. These vestments in four colors, green is a symbol of hope and growth, purple a sign of repentance, red a sign of the Holy Spirit or the martyrs who died for the sake of the faith, and white, always appropriate, a sign of uh, Jesus Christ, the light of the world, no darkness can extinguish. So the priest wears a stole. You notice Deacon Don wears one over one shoulder just to, to designate his role as a deacon. The outer vestment is called a chasuble. The word means little house. Like I could gain 40 pounds and get as big as a little house under this and you wouldn't even notice. It happened when I was first at base settlement. But uh, basically, it's uh, the pattern of a Roman soldier's cloak. It's just a half circle brought together to be like a cone that's called a conical. The seam is under here. It's a symbol of the church's charity. Not just my charity, but your charity our willingness to share. So lots of cloth, got to get used to, you know, controlling the cloth a little bit, but it's basically a sign that, you know, the Matthew 11, Jesus says, come to me. I'm gentle and humble of heart. Come to me with your need, with your sadness, with whatever it is. And you know here at Resurrection, we do so much to reach out, make people feel welcome, try and meet their spiritual and emotional and practical and material needs. So the chasuble is a symbol that the church is a place of charity. A lot of cloth, ample charity. We'll, we'll do whatever we can. We'll bust a hump to meet your needs. I'm going to talk about the bishop's appeal in a few minutes. That's part of it too. That, that charity, we, we put the needs of others right up there with our own, even ahead of our own sometimes. That's called sacrifice as well. Then just one other thing before we begin. Uh, about the entrance procession. It began when you decided sometime this week what mass you were going to come to. It began when you threw your foot out over the bedside this morning and began to move toward the shower or the toothbrush or the coffee pot or the pastry, whatever it might be, get yourself dressed and all that with whatever problems and joys have been a part of your life this week with the world news and the church news and all the rest. We flow out of our houses and our personal lives and we flow through those doors and we, the last stretch of it is flowing down this aisle and we gather with all we are, who we are, whatever that is, the good, the bad, the ugly, Jesus invites us. And the, the procession, the last lap of it, we won't do so much today. We'll let music gather us together. But it reminds us that we're flowing out of so many different directions, coming to be united in Christ. And then one final thing as we go, think of the Mass as a conversation, a grand conversation. And ask yourself, especially if you're getting bored or losing focus, who's talking to who right now? Like if I were to say, the Lord be with you. Exactly, we're talking to each other. I'm greeting you and, th that, and with your spirit. It's like, may God give you what you need, Tim, to do what you need to do for us in his church today. 
And then the lectors will come up in a minute. John will proclaim one of the readings. It's God talking to us from the reading using John's voice and John's ministry, but John talking to, or God talking to us. There'll be times when on your behalf I talk to God. There'll be times when we all talk to God and to each other like the Alleluia stuff. So just sort of track that along the way and see if that might not be helpful. Who's talking to who at any given moment, okay? Okay.